Our guest today is the president of the Chicago Transit Authority. He has served as general superintendent of the Chicago Park District. Our guest today has also served twice as chief of staff to Mayor Richard M. Daley. He was elected to two terms as a commissioner on the Cook County Board. Our guest today is a graduate of Southern Illinois University and the University of Illinois College of Law. Ladies and gentlemen, Forrest Claypool. Forrest. Thank you, Jay, for that kind introduction, and thank you all for coming out today. Uh, Jay acknowledged a couple of our members of the board, but I did want to acknowledge the CTA board members who I work with every day uh, and uh, uh, were with us today. Uh, Terry Peterson, the, the, my partner and chairman, Alejandro Silva, the head of our finance committee, uh, Jackie Grimshaw, who was mentioned earlier, Kevin Irvine, and Ashish Sen. So thank you all. Coming. Uh, so good morning. Let's talk about Ventra. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that in a minute. So. <laughs> Last December, I stood in this very room and talked about the things the CTA was going to do in 2013. And I'm proud that we have met our deadlines and achieved our goals. In fact, amidst the talk about the CTA's open fare system, you may have missed the fact that the CTA further executed Mayor Rahm Emanuel's vision to build a new Chicago and opened the reconstructed 10.2 mile red line south, allowing tens of thousands of commuters to enjoy a faster, smoother, better commute than ever before. And that's just a small part of what we've achieved, not to mention what we are planning to do in the future. Today, we're going to talk about all of that. But first, Ventra. CTA's, magnetic fare, CTA's current magnetic fare cards were introduced in 1997. Over time, however, there was increasing interest in contactless fare cards, and by November 2002, the CTA implemented its first contactless card, the Chicago card, system-wide. It was followed by the Chicago card plus, unique because it linked to the owner's credit or debit card in January 2004. The move towards what would become Ventra actually started in 2007 and was based on the belief that the country was moving towards an open standard contactless banking system. By 2009, CTA was notified that production of the chips used in the Chicago cards would soon end and began exploring new fair payment options to replace this existing aging one. The CTA in 2009 issued an RFP request for proposals uh, for uh, vendors uh, in, into the marketplace. While that was in the marketplace, in 2011, Governor Quinn signed a bill that mandated all transit agencies develop a universal fair payment system that allows customers to use, uh, to, that would allow customers to use more than one form of transit with one card by 2015. That same year, uh, two other things happened. The bids on the new system, which had been on the street for, uh, I guess, about 18 months to two years, came into the CTA in January of 2011. Uh, about five months after those bids arrived at the CTA, I was appointed by Mayor Emanuel to run the agency. And a few months later, the low bidder, Cubic Corporation, was awarded the $454 million bid for the open fare system. And so here we are. Since Ventura went fully live to the public on September the 9th, just eight weeks ago, we have been paying very close attention to the performance of the system and also of our contractor, Cubic Transportation Systems. With any contract the CTA enters into on behalf of the taxpayers, we hold the standard, we hold the vendor to a very high standard of performance. So much so that I've asked Richard Wonderly, the head of Cubic's North American Operations, to join me today to talk about this important topic. He agreed even before I finished asking him and got on a plane to come to Chicago. There is no question that overall, Ventra is working as a system. In just over seven weeks, the system has seen more than 25 million taps. 
about 4.7 million riders board with Ventra each week. Last week, about 55% of CTA rides went through Ventra. A majority, say this again, a majority of our customers have transitioned to the new Ventra system in less than 60 days. That number grows weekly. But even though hundreds of thousands of riders use the system smoothly every day, as we're all aware, there are a number of things that aren't going the way they should be or the way we want them to. In short, our vendor hasn't fully met our expectations yet or those of our customers. I want to take a few minutes today to talk a little more about that and let you know where things stand in the CTA's first transition to a completely new fair payment system in nearly 20 years. There's one main area where our contractor's performance simply has not been up to par, the customer service call center. About a month ago, that center was literally overwhelmed with 20,000 calls on a single day. Many customers couldn't get through at all. Those who did were left on hold, had to wait far too long to speak to a live operator, in some cases more than 30 minutes. Obviously, that's completely unacceptable. As soon as we learned the extent of the issue, we directed the contractor to triple the number of call takers to better serve customers. That has definitely helped. Wait times have dropped dramatically. Yesterday, the average wait time was below five minutes. We also changed the phone menu to better route calls so customers can get what they need more quickly. In fact, today, customers who are calling simply to activate or register their cards can do so in just a few minutes. And while things are better, it is not the top level of service we expect. Beginning this week, at my direction, the contractor will further expand and engage a second call center operator to provide both additional capacity in times of high volume, but also to help with continuous quality improvement on the calls themselves. Through the information we've gained by auditing the customer experience through observation and feedback, we know this is a necessary step and one that will resolve customer issues more quickly. We've also had reports of a few different technological issues, none widespread, but occurring with sufficient frequency that they are unacceptable and we must address them. Richard, Richard, Richard Wonderly is the Senior Vice President and General Man Manager of Cubic Transportation Systems. He is the head of Cubic's operations for all of North America. He'll join me now, Richard, if you come please. He'll join me now to help explain the current state of the system. Richard. Thank you for the opportunity to address everybody today. Who is Cubic? We are the largest automatic fare collection company in North America. We have contracts in over 40 countries. We have deployed systems in the cities you see up to today. New York City is a Cubic system. London, Sydney, Australia, Atlanta, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, San Diego. They're all Cubic systems. They all use a contactless smart car solution. We actually deployed the first smart car solution in Washington, D.C. Back, uh, back in the early 90s. I think Chicago was the second one we did. The system you have today is a cubic deployed system. We're very proud of that system today. We're going to be proud of the new one we're putting in. All these systems have been successful. Not one of them has failed. It will not fail here in Chicago either. What's different with this system than the other systems is something called an account-based system. The old system you have today and all the other systems in the world is a card-based system. All the intelligence is in the contactless smart card. When you touch a reader, it's instantaneously talking to the card, processing the transaction. As Forrest said, the banking industry came up with a new idea to use an account-based. That means every time you touch the card, the venture card to a reader, it goes to the back end, gathers information, relays it back to the reader, and activates the gate. That allows an easy deployment of new fare, new fare policies that they may come up for the CTA. They were deployed in a matter of days as opposed to months. It allows people to use a, any contactless smart card, like a credit card or a debit card you have in your wallet, you can use that. People who come to O'Hare for the first time don't need to buy a ticket. They get to simply use the credit card in their wallet if it has a contactless chip in it. Those are many of the benefits of an account-based solution but that account-based solution takes a little bit more time to go to the back end and get back to the reader in order to allow it to go through the gate. The contract we have with CTA today 
is a 12-year contract, and the first two years is coming to an end. That was the design and build phrase. The service contract doesn't start until January, is the, is the targeted date. So we're in this transition period. So for the first two years, Cubic has spent $92 million of our money. We haven't gotten a dime from the CTA. We won't get any money from the CTA until the system meets the requirements of the CTA. Hopefully that's gonna be the first part of next year. That's how Cubic recovers its investment. We're here for the long haul. It's a 10-year service contract. We do many of the services that CTA used to do. We're taking those on ourselves. We took on all the responsibility. We took on all the risk associated with changing out equipment or changing out technology over the next 10 years. That's all part of that $400 million contract. We've heard comments that the transaction times are taking too long at the gate. 95, as of yesterday, 95% of the transactions that all the readers we have were processing in less than two and a half seconds. That's a requirement of CTA. We met that requirement. We're going to put a software fix in this coming weekend that's going to make sure it's 100% of the transactions are processed in two and a half seconds. No longer than two and a half. The majority of these are down in a half a second range. Again, I mean, it takes an extra little second because it's an account-based system. It has to go back to the back end, back to the reader. That's pretty damn fast. He asked me to go back and forth to a home computer and back to a reader with uh, hundreds of thousands simultaneous transactions going on. And then the other one, we had multiple taps. There was a question that multiple taps were causing people to get charged twice. If you present two cards, two credit cards in your wallet to the reader, it's going to pick the first card it sees and it's going to read that card, charge that card. It's impossible to get a double charge that way. It's only going to read one. What could happen if you present your wallet, like it is in the picture there, and you have a monthly passive entry card, and you also have a Visa card in your wallet, it may charge the Visa card because you presented it two options. It's going to pick the first one it reads, and you might, in fact, get the charge twice that way. So what we don't want to do is what's in the picture. Don't present a whole wallet full of contactless cards and assume the reader's going to pick the one you want it to use. It'd be like going to Macy's and giving the sales clerk, here's six cards, pick the one you want to use, and I'll be happy with it. So we have to be selective, present the correct card, and we can eliminate those kind of double charge opportunities. The slowness of the reader, because going back and forth to the back end, set a perception that Venture was broken. People were standing lines, the lines were getting longer, people were getting agitated. So what you would do is you would continue to tap the reader, assuming that it's not working, you just keep tapping it. If that didn't happen, you went over and tapped another read or another gate on a different reader, and that caused other confusion. Venture wasn't broken, it was too slow a processing. So what we've done last weekend is we put this new screen on all the gates that says, your card is processing, please wait. Therefore, asking the writer not to re-tap, just wait for the transaction to process and we'll eliminate those kind of uh, delays at the gates we feel. Uh, at the same time, I said the software fix is going in this weekend. It's not really fixed, it's an upgrade, so we're going to limit all those transactions to two and a half seconds and eliminate all the confusion at the gate. We have readers on buses. We use wireless technology. What happens when you have wireless technology and you're walking around the city talking on the phone? You hit dead spots. We have dead spots in the buses. It causes the reader not to perform as well as it should. There's no way around that. The other piece of it is we have our reader currently connected through some other equipment on the bus, other manufacturer's equipment. Mm -hmm. We're going to change that configuration. We're going to have the readers speak directly to the Ventra back end and improve the performance that way. We'll roll out that configuration change in the next couple of weeks that will improve the performance on the bus. So I guess in closing, it, Cubic is a large company. We've done more of these systems than anybody else in the world. We are the best at it. We're not going away. We have a 10-year contract. We're here for the long haul. This system will work, and we'll all be proud of it. So thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Bottom line, 
The bottom line is that too many of our customers are confused and frustrated, and that's our fault. That's especially true for our Chicago Card customers. For that reason, we have taken steps to help the last of our Chicago Card, Chicago Card Plus customers make the transition to Ventra. This group represents about 17% of our customers, but unfortunately, they experience the majority of the problems related to the transition. Our goal with this group was to make the transition easy by mailing them Ventra cards to replace their old Chicago cards and to automatically transfer their balance. Though the intentions were good and the plan well mapped out, the execution fell far short of what it should have been. Though many people transitioned smoothly, far, far too many were confused and frustrated through no fault of their own. So the CTA has done, since then, has done everything we can to help Chicago Card customers transition. We've done this, we've done a number of things. We're, we've made significant changes to the VentraChicago.com website to make it more user friendly and to address their specific issues. We've provided new email instructions. We, are, we have mail, mailed all cardholders with accurate registered addresses uh, new Venture cards. And we've made more than 110,000 phone calls directly to those customers to ensure that they have received them and to assist them in activation. One of the processes in the transition as well is, um, is the delivery of the reduced spare cards through the Regional Transit Authority. Uh, as you can see above, 309,000 Ventra cards have been issued uh, to date from the RTA, representing 44% of the total with 240,000 to go. 67% uh, 67, 67 of the balance is for seniors and disabled free rides. Uh, so the RTA uh, will be monitoring that and working closely with the RTA uh, to ensure that the remaining cards also go out in a timely way uh, to serve the reduced fare uh, population so they can receive and activate their new venture cards. So over the last few weeks, we've made progress on a number of fronts. Um, and we have now have clear data uh, and have analyzed that data to tell us what's happening in the system, to what degree, where, and how to fix it, as you've heard today from, uh, from Richard Wonderly from Cubic. And, uh, over the last uh, few weeks, we've made progress on that, and we're continue to have uh, the, the fixes in the works that Richard indicated, some of which have already been deployed. But we also recognize there's still a lot of hard work to do before we reach the point where we at the CTA feel comfortable moving forward to the next Ventra milestone. From day one, we've said we're committed to giving our customers ample time to transition to Ventra. As we've noted many times before, this is why we designed an, ex an extended transition for Ventra. We felt such a phased and extended rollout was prudent because they knew there would be un unforeseen hiccups in the system as there are with all new, all new technologies, particularly the first in North America. That's why we're announcing today that we are extending the deadline for the full transition to Ventra. Originally, November 15th was a date we were to have fully uh, cut off uh, certain loading on certain cards as, a, as the next step in the transition. So we are pushing that date back to a date to be determined. There are three areas of performance that Cubic must meet in order for us to feel comfortable moving forward. First, callers should experience a wait time of five minutes or less to speak to an operator. Second, vending machines and card readers on both buses and at rail stations must have a 99% availability. Last, all readers must process taps in 2.5 seconds or less, 99% of the time. Cubic will not be paid until it achieves those benchmarks. Once Cubic reaches those goals, then we'll announce a new timetable to fully transition to the new system. Our promise to our customers is that the system will be fixed, just as we lived up to our promise to fix the Red Line South. Two weeks ago, I stood alongside Mayor Emanuel and CTA Board Chairman Terry Peterson at the 95th Street Red Line Station, where we greeted customers returning to the Red Line South for the first time in five months. We went there to thank our customers, thank them for their patience, for their resilience. We thank them for their faith and for their support in our decision, which was controversial and caused inconvenience. But we also heard over and over those same words coming back to us. Thank you for making the ride faster, smoother, for making the commute better. Thank you for providing those free shuttles and the discounted bus rides. Thank you for finishing on time and on budget. And thank you for providing jobs and contracting opportunities for those who are so often shut out from this kind of work. And thank you for paying attention to the South Side. Even the media, quick to point out where we do things wrong, gave us props. <laughs> the decision to tackle Red Line South and to do it the way we did is a direct reflection of the mayor's leadership. He had the courage to make the tough but absolutely correct 
decision to close down 10 miles of the CTA's busiest rail line and rebuild it in the lightning fast time of five months versus the option of four plus years of weekends only work that would have confused and disrupted commuters and communities for much longer than necessary. What we did has never been done before anywhere in the country. In every way possible, this was the right thing to do for a large scale public works project. We chose the quickest, most cost effective strategy and by doing so saved $75 million that was used to rehabilitate the Red Line South stations, including making the remaining three stations disabled accessible with new elevators. Last year on June 4th, I was joined by Chairman Peterson and Sherry Runner, Senior Vice President of the Chicago Urban League, to announce our plans to rebuild the Red Line. From the outside, from the outset, we had a lot of detractors. In fact, some media outlets proclaimed the project doomed before it even started, like the cover story above, which ran two days in advance of the project's start. We avoided that big mess by talking with the community for nearly a year before the project to determine how best to meet their needs during construction. We put together the largest alternative service plan in the CTA's history, free shuttles, extra bus service, even train, red line trains running on green line tracks. And we paid special attention to problems with similar projects from the not so distant past, including the Dan Ryan reconstruction projects of the past two decades and the Metro flyover project going on right now. Mm -hmm. The issues that confuse these projects range from the lack of inclusion for minority and women owned firms during construction to a failure of the contractor vetting and oversight to the absence of real job opportunities for community residents. Our takeaways were simple. Demand fairness from our prime contractors, provide as much alternative service information as possible, and ensure that the residents and businesses near the footprint of the project know about the job and contracting opportunities. We did this literally door to door by deploying teams to take literature, like the flyer you see above, straight to homes and businesses. In the stations, with Red Line ambassadors distributing literature and answering questions in advance of the construction dates. And on the web, providing a robust website, redlinesouth.com, to re detail everything that was happening and was going to happen. And we were on the air for nearly a year and a half with radio commercials reminding people about the coming project and its impacts on them and the myriad media appearances hammering home that the project was coming and that our customers needed to prepare themselves. But our biggest in impact came from taking our message directly to the community. We did everything we could to promote opportunities for jobs and contracts. We set and met ambitious goals for disadvantaged business enterprises. And we hosted seven meet and greets with prime contractors so they could get to know these DBEs. We hosted three job fairs in the disaffected community, in, in the affected community. The response was incredible, with more than 4,000 job seekers attending the three events. And we, and we, we, the majority of our hiring was from those events, overwhelmingly. It was obvious the word had gotten out. And we created jobs, more than 1,500 of them, about 1,000 construction, and at least two firms that worked on the project will be keeping those workers for future projects. More than 400 of them became CTA bus drivers and will stay with us long after this project. In fact, I'm proud to announce today that last Friday, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9, extended an invitation to seven Red Line South electricians, all of whom are pictured among the, the group in the photo above, to join their union as a result of their hard work during the project. The invitation was unexpected by the electricians and frankly by the CTA, but we've said since day one that our goal was to find work for people beyond the life of the project so that these workers will now be able to work on future projects not just at the CTA, but everywhere. Red Line South set the bar pretty high, and in 2014, we'll be making many more jumps. Next year, we're continuing with the next steps on Mayor Emanuel's ambitious capital investment program, the most ambitious the CTA has ever undertaken. When the mayor took office in 2011, he announced a $4 billion plan to modernize the CTA's transit system to move the CTA forward under that vision. To execute that vision, we stuck to the R's of the new CTA, reform, renew, rebuild. One of the reforms is supply chain modernization, which has resulted in $4.3 million in reductions of CTA inventory in just six months. In the same amount of time, we reduced the obsolete and excess inventory by $6.5 million. If you go back to the beginning of the year, that number was above 15 million. We reclaimed more than 1 million of inventory that we found through inventory counts. We knew that through an upgrade in simple technology, like barcoding and scanning, CTA could track worker productivity and follow parts from cradle to grave in the warehouse. And we're very pleased with the results, which include fewer buses and trains out of service awaiting parts in the future. 
Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of enthusiasm for the uh, move to uh, technology, the bar, the scanning technology, and we adopted Mayor, I mean, we adopted President Obama's uh, campaign slogan, except we twisted a little bit to, yes, we scan, so that's what the t-shirts say there, so. We've also uh, expanded our popular uh, bus tracker system. Um, additionally, as of this fall, all 145 of our rail stations have at least one electronic screen displaying CTA's train tracker service which has become very popular with our customers. And in fact, we installed 87 new ones in the Red Line South alone, and we'll continue to install them. We've made Train Tracker better. On the big screen, you can see how customers can find the closest train station or figure out when the train they want to take will arrive at the desired destination. Customers can choose from new features like Stops Near Me that let customers with GPS-enabled devices detect the closest stations. We also have a station name search function that allows customers to quickly get station information by typing in just a small part of the station name instead of having to scroll down the screen to find the stop. And some customers like our mapping function where they can actually watch trains move in near real time on an interactive desktop map. Over the past two years, we've also made a top priority of installing security cameras, 1,800 cameras in our rail stations, bringing our total number of cameras in those stations to more than 3,600. As we continue to add additional cameras on our older rail cars, more than 5,000 cameras on our rail cars and as many as 10 cameras on each of our buses. The CTA also works closely with the Chicago Department of, uh, Police Department um, and we actually supplement their officer corps uh, in order to combat crime and create a more secure environment for our customers. Last year, these CTA cameras that we installed assisted police in the arrest of at least 154 individuals for crimes committed either on or off CTA property. So far in 2013, cameras have aided in the arrest of at least 140 individuals. The facial recognition technology available with these cameras allows us to get digitally crisp images that ease identifying and apprehending criminals. And most of the individuals that are arrested are recidivists, so you really, each one you arrest and take off the street, you're eliminating a one-person one crime wave. And while new technology is very important at the CTA, it's what people see, touch, and ride that defines the customer experience. And with that in mind, last year we gave facelifts to seven stations on the North Red Line by tackling 86 million in capital maintenance work. Most of those stations date from the 1900s. We also will soon start work at a new station at Wilson that will be a far cry from the current decrepit 90-year-old station. The new station will be a transfer point between the red and the purple lines, and more importantly, we believe it will serve as a new community anchor for the uptown redevelopment in that neighborhood and spur more economic activity there. The CTA is also aggressively updating its rail and bus fleets to provide customers with modern, reliable transportation they deserve, and at the same time lowering future agency costs for maintenance. We continue to take delivery of our 5,000 rail car fleet, the latest generation. As of last week, we'd received more than 340 of the cars nearly half of our total order, and we'll continue deploying them on the red line through 2014. I'm also pleased to unveil the conceptual design of our new 7,000 series train car, which will go out, which will come in with bids soon. <laughs> Actually, I pulled this from an old Jetsons cartoon. So, so. Uh, but seriously, the bids do come in in December for the new 7,000 rail car, so that will be the next generation. Uh, on the bus side, we're continuing to receive brand new buses and to completely overhaul some of our new buses in, in issues that will give us all, an almost entirely new bus fleet of more than 1,800 vehicles. But perhaps the most exciting project we're starting next year is the complete reconstruction of the terminal at 95th Street on the Red Line. When it opened in 1969, it was state of the art. Architect Skidmore Owings and Merrill incorporated the clean, minimal, minimalist design aesthetic of the international school trend of the time. But like the Red Line South we just rebuilt, the terminal just doesn't meet the standards of modern day transit. Today, more than 20,000 customers use the terminal on an average weekday with 24 hour Red Line service and over 1,000 CTA and PACE bus trips on a typical weekday. As you can see, bus bays are overcrowded and terribly inadequate for the population we serve. We are still finalizing the, the design of the new terminal, but it will be larger and much more functional than the existing facility, safer, and more pedestrian friendly. Because this is such a signature project, and given the unique opportunity we have, Mayor Emanuel has tapped Theester Gates, an internationally known Chicago-based artist, to create artworks for the terminal, for what will be the largest public artwork project in the agency's history. At the end of the day, the public discussion about transit is wide-ranging and complex, but really boils down to two questions. 
What is this really about? And why should we care? In my view, it's about two things. First, it's about Chicago's position as a world-class city, remaining attractive to new visitors and businesses alike. Consider the recent decision by GE Transportation to relocate to Chicago. As you can see from the Sun-Times story, Chicago's role as a transportation hub and the mayor's commitment to rebuilding the city's infrastructure were key behind moving the company to Chicago, underscoring why there is an unprecedented level of transit and other investment by the mayor going on in Chicago right now. But in the final analysis, it's about our customers, the people of this great city. This quote from former Milwaukee Mayor John Norquist, now a Chicagoan and CEO of the Congress on New Urbanism, explains with power how great cities have driven human progress. Great cities are dense. They attract people of energy and talent and arts and science and commerce to live and work in close proximity to one another in order to share ideas and advance interests. And if you want to ensure that urban density survives and thrives, you need a, the strong arteries of mass transit to carry people efficiently and conveniently to, to, to work and play, facilitating the easy interaction of neighborhoods to downtown and back. Quality mass transit is a linchpin in the job-creating, idea-creating, wealth-creating power of great metropolises like Chicago. Under the leadership of Mayor Emanuel, we have been charged to move boldly forward and bring innovation and modernization to the CTA with an eye toward serving our riders. And we will continue to do exactly that. Thank you for having me here today. Yeah, don't leave. Uh, we have a few questions here. We may even have a few questions for your associate, uh, Mr. Uh, Wonderly. Um, who I'm sure took either the blue or orange line in from either uh, Midway or O'Hare. Well, good. I'm glad. Um, so he may be asked a few questions also because there is no free lunch in Chicago, as we know. Uh, the first question I have, and if anyone else has some questions, we have um, City Club staff around the room. They'll come by and pick up your question. We'll try to um, answer as many as we can. Try to keep your um, responses direct and to the point, like a jump bus system. You know that? We don't have to make every single stop. First question, Joe Manzi. Where are you, Joe? Joe's a city club member back there. His question, since the methodology of a total line cut was so successful on the Ryan Red Line, would the CTA do it again if the circumstances were similar? Uh, yeah, and first of all, let me thank uh, Joe because he was a big part of the Red Line success. Um, so thank you, Joe. Um, the, um, um, yes, the answer is yes to that. Um, the advantage, the, the one advantage we had was obviously that the Red Line South was in the middle of a highway, um, uh, not in a dense urban neighborhood, and had e quick access to the Dan Ryan, which is why our shuttles, I think, worked effectively where they were staged, connecting them to the Green Line service. Um, whether you could do that, we could do it again, I think, but if you were, for example, uh, doing something similar in a very dense urban neighborhood with homes literally pushed up against the tracks and had narrow urban, urban streets as your, uh, as your shuttle points, could you pull that off? I think that's an open question. Uh, but we would certainly look to, I think going forward, I think we're, we would not be afraid to look at, we would not be afraid to look at options that condense condense the both time of a project and the cost of the project um, as long as we did that in concert with the community. The key was the community because we, as it, with Terry Peterson and I, the CTA board, the mayor, we invested an enormous amount of time talking to the community and they bought in to the notion. It was with their support, without their support we could not have moved ahead and it was not only the mayor's courage, it was the, alder, the elected officials courage, the aldermen in the south side who backed our decision and said it was the right decision. And frankly, when Terry and I went out in the, into the community, um, we were really surprised that how broad a support there was and an, almost an immediate understanding of why this short-term sacrifice was in their interest. It was remarkable, really, and, 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 it was, and that's why we are so grateful, we're grateful to our customers. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, uh, Mr. Claypool. Uh, this is from uh, City Club member T. Welch, um, who's back there. Um, why does it cost five dollars to get a Ventra card? Why isn't it free? Uh, it, is, it is free if you take a few minutes to, uh, to register it. Uh, it just takes a few minutes online or by phone to register it and your money's back in your account within 24 hours. Okay. 
It's very short and sweet. Thank you. Uh, this is from our um, chairman of the board, who's not here today, Dr. Paul Green. Any chance to consolidate the Pace Metra and CTA under one regional transit board with power? Uh, well, what, what is, I suppose anything's possible. I'm already on record as saying that's crazy. Um, and I'll say it again, it's crazy. Um, we serve very different missions, very different equipment, very different um, logistics. Um, and um, I, I, as I said, I've also said before, I don't understand how back-to-back um, -back ethics scandals at Metra have led to a discussion about a super agency in northeastern Illinois. I, I thought the discussion would be about ethics. But apparently, we're not talking about ethics, we're talking about merging transit agencies, which I, to this moment, still don't understand. Okay, thank you. We'll relay that to Paul. Um, <laughs> even when he's not here, he's here. Uh, Steve Schlickman. Steve, where are you? Steve's a city club member, former student of mine, actually, um, affiliated with the UIC Urban Transportation Center. Here's his question. Many years ago, CTA had the best professional development program in the nation. What is CTA doing now in that regard? Uh, we have a program underway now. It's called uh, MIT. What does it stand for again, Carol? Managers in training. But MIT, like, you know, you know, MIT. So <laughs> we, like them th th we like them to think they're going to MIT. So. Um, and uh, we devote, these are individuals that have been, um, because of their promise as up and coming uh, employees and, and potential managers, uh, we've selected for a rigorous uh, year long program in which they basically have to sacrifice uh, some, uh, uh, quite a few number of their weekends over the course of the year for rigorous two day um, programs, uh, curriculum. It's, uh, we're supported by DePaul University, um, and um, uh, we, are, we are trying to groom the next generation of managers rather than simply uh, hope and pray that uh, when the time comes, we'll, we'll have the farm system. So we, we're investing in our farm system. Okay, Forrest, I think uh, Steve may have been suggesting that in addition to DePaul, you consider um, the University of Illinois at Chicago. <laughs> Carlos Ponce, who's sitting over here, his question is, at $400 million, does Cubic, Mr. Wonderly, have local MBE, WBE partners? Are there set goals for African American and Hispanic participation? You want to handle that, or maybe uh, you, Mr. Wonderly? You want to, you know? Absolutely. We have uh, requirements for the contract, but we go far above the requirements for our local people. <laughs> Rich, why don't you come here, take advantage of our mic. We do have requirements in the contract to meet those goals. We actually exceed them. We have women's uh, WBEs and DBEs on staff throughout the, uh, throughout the contract and throughout the city of Chicago. Thank you, Richard. Maybe you shouldn't go away. You may be called back. So have a seat. <laughs> Uh, Yona Freemark from the Metropolitan Planning Council. Yona, where are you? Right here. Okay. His question is, are you considering using value capture to finance the red-purple modernization project? Uh, that's, that's a very good question. And I, and I think, uh, I would say everything's on the table. And I think value capture is something that uh, our, our consultants are, are looking at. Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, has done some early work on those sorts of issues. It's way premature, but uh, you know the theory is, for those of you who don't know value capture, the notion is, is that if you build a project uh, that significantly um, modernizes, improves, adds value to, to an urban core, you are, by definition, going to create uh, wealth. You're going to create higher property values, uh, economic development, higher sales revenues in those areas, higher demand, and that uh, that, that increment can be captured and help finance part of uh, uh, the project itself through various uh, financing mechanisms. Thank you, Forrest. Um, this is from City Club member Ashwin Ladd. Ashwin, where are you? Ashwin, I'm sorry. His question, any plans to have transfer points between the blue, the brown, and the red lines on the north and northwest sides? Yes. 
What, what do you mean by transfer yeah. points? Coming from O'Hare, transfer on the north, so come downtown to transfer, come back up and transfer. You mean a new connection? Yes. Um, I think that that connect. Uh, he's asking if there's, um, I guess, plans in the works or it's, a, it's ever possible to connect uh, between the brown, the blue, the brown, and the red coming from O'Hare. I mean, there's certainly, if you look at a map, it's clear that that's a missing piece of, of the puzzle that you would really want. Um, the question, of course, is cost, scale, funding. Um, you know, it's certainly something that, from an economic development, city service, long term perspective, makes a lot of sense. Um, can't tell you the money's there to do it, but I think it should be certainly something that's on the planning table. Thank you. Uh, we have a few more questions here. Uh, this is from the uh, conductor of the City Club Symphony, Dr. Charles Mangini. Are there any plans for public service announcements, TV, radio, to quote unquote educate people on how to best use the Ventra system? Uh, the, the best really is the Venture website itself, which has been improved, and also there's how-to videos on it, um, uh, VentureChicago.com, uh, and you can go there. Uh, even the CTA website has the, the videos, but uh, VentureChicago.com, they're just very easy, quick to watch videos that literally walk you through every single step. Okay. Uh, this is from Carol Barney. Carol, where are you? Carol's not a City Club member, but we'd like to have you join, <laughs> unless you're a starving artist. Because her question is, can you describe the role of the 95th Street artist a little more? Um, I wish I could. Um, it's um, much more complicated and big than I can even begin to explain, because uh, uh, Mr. Gates is uh, more than just an artist. He incorporates his artwork really into the architectural structure of the design itself. Um, and he involves the community in the process and actually employs members of the community in the process. So. Um, the CTA board has, uh, has uh, looked at his proposals, has approved them, um, um, we're excited about it, it's a work in progress. Um, but if you can look him up, he's worth Googling and reading about. He's a Chicago treasure, he's internationally renowned, and his participation in the 95th Street Station project is going to make it all the more uh, extraordinary. Okay, thank you. Um, this is uh, from one of our members. Any reports of Michigan Avenue or any other Main Street CTA bus drivers being exasperated and or angered by bicycle driving Chicagoans? The, the question was not asked by Gabe Klein, I'll tell you that right now. No, there's always perfect harmony between bus drivers, bikers, <laughs> pedestrians. So. Okay, and I guess as... Um, I get to ask the last question today since there are no other uh, questions that I have. Um, when you use the Venture card, I used it on the bus the other day, it accepted it, which was good, told me to go, but it didn't tell me what my balance was on the card. When I used to use the magnetic stripe card, I would get a readout which say, you know, I still have $10 left on my card. Um, this is kind of inconvenient, it forces us to guess, to either go to a subway station where I could add money or something of that nature. How are you going to deal with that question? We've got an answer for you. Excellent. Jackson, I mean, uh, Rich, come back up here. It gets back to the account-based solution. When it was on the card, it was instantaneous. When you go to the back end to pick up a balance, you really don't know what the balance is. We don't know what ride you're going to take. We don't know if there's a transfer involved from the ride you just took. It takes several minutes to get all those connections made up in order to give you the best fare possible, we can't display that on the card. If you want to know what the balance is of the card, you can go to any of the CVS uh, outlets and they can tap it and tell you. You can go to any vending machine and tap the card, it will read out your balance, but it can't do it at the gate. That's one of the side effects of having an account-based solution that gives you all the other benefits. This is one that it doesn't do. Richard, I have one question. Is there a possibility of something that says, like, low balance? Or we are doing that. There will be, a, today, it's a little, it goes too fast, and we're going to slow it down, but it, even when it says go, if you have a low balance, kind of giving a warning you're less than $10, it prints out low balance. It still allows you to enter the, enter the uh, train or the turnstile, but it tells you how to get some more money in your car pretty quick. The, the last comment I wanted to make was we spent two years engineering this system, testing it, and I was being uh, with, with all the engineers we have at Cubic, but at the end of it, this transition period wasn't our shiny light. And for that, I want to apologize to the writers of 
CTA over the last couple of months. It wasn't our best effort, but it will get better. So I apologize for that. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. And uh, one of our staff members, the Vaunted City Club staff, uh, we'll do our famous drawing. So if we come up here, maybe we could ask Mr. Claypool to pick out a card. Oh yeah, this will be worth uh, five. It's a Maggiano gift certificate. Sure, absolutely. Not looking. Not looking. Not looking. Members of the CTA and their families are not eligible, of course. Terry, you'll have to pay your own way. Ah. Laura Utrada. Director of Corporate and Foundation Relations from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Laura? Yeah. Oh, just, uh, 